production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors and viewers like you, thank you. This time on Broad and High, the circus comes to town in the latest performance from Clintonville's Flux Flow Dance Project. Ursula is dedicated to anyone who's ever worked for someone they don't like. Meet a Columbus man who's also a thrifty knitter. It's got a big hole in it, but uh, I can use that. And Driftmouth visits the studio with their sounds of Appalachia. And brought them all the way this and more time. right now on Broad and High. Hi everyone, I'm Kate Quickle and welcome to Broad and High. The Flux Flow Dance Project is a contemporary dance company located in Clintonville that challenges the conventional ideas about dance and storytelling. They presented their most recent project, titled Ursula, last month at the Wexner Center. The multidisciplinary project blends dance, theater, and music, and also explores the social power dynamics within a world of a fictional circus. We went behind the scenes with the three dancers to learn more about how the story of a circus bear and monkey is an allegory for the limited freedoms of the workplace. Dance is a really special language. I, I feel like it says a lot of things that we're not able to say through any other medium. Ursula's dedicated to anyone who's ever work for someone they don't like. So we have this monkey and a bear, and this monkey and bear are in a circus, and they do not like the circus director. It's a very unfair place. The conditions are not ideal. And uh, the monkey kind of has the idea of like, we should really get out and sort of convinces the bear to come out with him. So they make an escape and slowly but surely it evolves into the monkey becoming the master of the bear. So this is Flux and Flow Dance and Movement Center, which is a dance space in Clintonville. In the evening, we're giving adult uh, dancers a space to move and be creative and be artists. And then during the day, we're making our own work as Flux Flow Dance Project with my husband, Filippo, who's the co-founder, co-director of the company, and our collaborator, Kelly Herbert, who dances and performs with us and also helps co-create. We're about three weeks out from the performances, so it's a fun place to be, and it's also a little bit of the place of like, well, let's see where it all goes. We actually went to the zoo, and <laughs> we studied the animals. <laughs> we talked about like, okay, how do we best embody the sensibilities of a bear? This sort of like roundness and slowness and gravity to like every step. Um, and then the, the monkey, a little bit more like maniacal and um, kind of like fast twitch and um, quirky in ways. So as we travel back and forth between the characters, hopefully the audience has a sense of these different embodiments. We're trying to find a way to move a narrative forward through a series of scenes that make sense dramaturgically, but they aren't predictably all the same media or style. So we were trying to intentionally create scenes that have various um, technical approaches. We have some scenes that are contemporary dance, some scenes that are ballet, some scenes that are theater, something that's a projection where it's in Italian with hands moving but subtitles underneath. This scene is actually, it's a really beautiful scene. At this point, the monkey and the bear have escaped and they're trying to build their own show together. Frank and Ursula are the monkey and the bear and Ursula's exhausted. She's, she's just 
worked herself absolutely tirelessly and she's trying to explain to the monkey that she's she's tired she just like wants to settle down she wants she wants to just like have a life and just be re like relaxed and um, the monkey saying like can't you push just a little bit further for me like just a few more shows we're almost there we've almost made it that sort of conversation back and forth Fine. Leave. I don't need you. It's sometimes tough because it's, it's really close to reality, the topics that we use and that we explore. And I'm like 30 and I've been dancing for a while and I am so excited that I always feel that there's something next, like exploring point shoes. That was like, I never thought that I was gonna do that, but there's always that growing So we had this idea of having fur unitards because the two characters are animals. Well, my mom has been a seamstress for her entire life, essentially, and she's very meticulous and excellent at what she does, so I knew I could trust her, <laughs> and I knew she would do a great job. But she, um, she said that the fabric that I selected was very difficult to work with. You can't use a cotton, you can't use a linen, you have to use a fabric that stretches and it's got to stretch in all ways. So that was the problem with the fake fur fabric. It was knitted on the back, but it only stretched one way, up and down. It did not stretch across. So I was like, hmm, well, I still really like this fabric and I want to use it. So uh, she was able to kind of help us find the solution that made sense. So all of these black stripes are lycra. So all of the joints that needed that mobility um, had space to move, but it also is really aesthetically interesting. So we were able to find a way to make it functional that also felt really designy. I think that sometimes when we come to a dance show, we expect to see only dance, like an hour of, of movement. And dance is so intertwined with so many other mediums. And it, it really takes the whole picture especially for this piece, for Ursula. There are so many elements that are, are intertwined inside of it to create this story. And I, I hope that audiences walk away appreciating that dance can be so many, so many things. The Flux and Flow Dance and Movement Center is located in Clintonville, in the space once occupied by the Clintonville Community Market. And they offer a wide variety of movement classes for both kids and adults of all skill levels, from slow flow yoga and beginner ballet to hip hop, tap, and afro pop. Learn more about them at flux-flow.com. Most new knitters start by making a scarf. The first thing E.J. Jones ever knitted was an Irish fisherman sweater. This German village area resident never shies away from a challenge, and he never shies away from a good deal either. Check out how E.J., known as the man who knits, contributes to the current trend of upcycling. I am E.J. Jones, and I am the man who knits. I only knit with natural fibers, probably cashmere and camel hair and wool are my favorites. I look, I look everywhere for, for yarn. Next spot is women's sweaters. Nothing, nothing, nothing. I'm looking for wool. And I'm looking for cashmere, basically. Ah, but looky here. Here's something we want. Let's see, this is, this is 100% cashmere. And it's half price. And it is, that is, I can use that, the back, and like, I won't use the front, but I can use the back there. So that goes in the cart. When I go to the Salvation Army, I am 
looking for the largest sweater that has the most designer characters to it that is cashmere. Well, here's one. It's got a big hole in it, but uh, I can use that. I could not afford yarn that I'm used to knitting with for sweaters. They were very, the yarn's very expensive, and I found that if you buy a sweater and you can take it apart, you've got, for the most part, pretty good yarn to work with. So, so being retired and on a limited income, like I am, I had, this is what I had to re return to. And you see, it only takes me an hour to, to, an hour to two hours at most to take a sweater apart. And what I do to take it apart, I just take a little seam ripper and I just go in here and rip it apart. So the sleeve is off and I have, and all I have is found the, the loose end. And what I do is put this on the ball winder and then just start taking it apart. And you can see, this is, uh, goes pretty fast. We're just about done here. I like to get all the wool. If I'm gonna pay 99 cents for a sweater, I'm gonna definitely get all the wool I can. There is the sleeve of the sweater. The story of my knitting history starts first time I was in Ireland. I was on business. And the people I was doing business with all had Aaron sweaters on. And I said, oh, those are pretty. So I went and bought an Aaron sweater for myself, fell in love with it. So I wanted to learn how to knit. And that was probably 15 years ago. Since then, I've knitted probably close, at least a few less than 30 sweaters. I learned how to knit hats from a sweater that I had finished and had extra yarn. So I knitted a hat. This is a toque. This is a flat top. It comes from a chef's hat. It's T-O-Q-U-E. I am going to put it on to see what I feel like it or not. What do you think? As opposed to a rounded, a rounded top, there is not one alike. They're all different. All made from recycled sweaters. I graduated from Ohio State and I was in the wholesale beer and wine business for 30 years before I retired. I probably knit four or five hours a day. It gives me a reason to get up in the morning and, and it keeps me busy. I used to express myself through wine. Now I express myself through knitting of hats. Columbus musician Lou Poster of Driftmouth likes to share the stories of where he's from. Born and raised in the coal mining country of West Virginia, he celebrates his Appalachian roots through music and lyrics that are influenced by country and bluegrass. With Jess Kaufman on bass and David Murphy on drums, the trio stopped by our studio to share their song, Love Ridge is Burning. Just 
Want to hear more from Driftmouth? Check out more from their visit to the WOSU studios at wosu.org slash local tunes. Meanwhile, give them a follow on Facebook to see where they're playing live in concert. Sci-fi has long been a successful Hollywood genre, with films that feature everything from time machines and space aliens to giant bugs. Recently, a scientist at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History took a look at the facts and fiction behind the 1954 cult classic, Them, that brought gigantic, irradiated ants to the big screen. Enjoy this next story from our friends at WVIZ-PBS up in Cleveland. Exterior, desert in New Mexico, day. A New Mexico state police plane soars across the cloudless sky. But they don't show New Mexico terrain. It, in fact, was filmed in Southern California, and I knew that terrain. Quiet. There we go. My name is Joe Hannibal, and I am the curator of invertebrate paleontology at the Cleveland Museum of Natural History. I love movies. I like old movies. I like uh, movies that have giant bugs in them. And I especially like uh, the movie Them, because it is the mother of all bug movies. There is no word to describe them. In the 
seminal creature feature from 1954, giant mutant ants wreak havoc on an unsuspecting public. Humanity's only hope lies in the bumbling Dr. Medford and his bombshell daughter, both of whom are myrmecologists, ant specialists. It might sound hokey, but the film is crawling with charm, according to Dr. Hannibal. Number one, the music. It's spectacular music with crescendos of information. I like the noises made by the ants. Okay, they're not too accurate, but they are cool. And it does have a series of very accurate observations in it. These accurate observations were in the spotlight at the Capitol Theater last week, as moviegoers were treated to a special screening of the sci-fi film, along with a post-film chat with Dr. Hannibal. Yeah. It's called Arthropleura. It's part of the Real Science Film Series, a collaboration between the Cleveland Museum of Natural History and Cleveland Cinemas. Real Science is an attempt to engage the public with our curators who have knowledge about particular kinds of science that ties into movies. And Dr. Hannibal's past study of giant prehistoric arthropods, a phylum that includes insects like ants, makes him uniquely qualified to uncover the real and not-so-real science of them. Well, you, you might say that the ants are not the most accurately uh, reproduced ants in the movie business. And that, in fact, well, they're kind of funny-looking ants. But, heck, there's such big kernels of truth in the movie, it's amazing. Okay. There are no big ants like that, but there could be big arthropods like that, and there were in the past. There was an animal about eight feet long. This is a giant uh, uh, arthropod. They made trackways in the uh, sand and mud during the coal age, about 300 million years ago, and pieces, parts of them are found uh, all over the place. A lot of my study has been about fossil arthropods, and among these arthropods are rather large ones, including supposed giant millipedes and even bigger giant millipedes. And in the movie, they actually replicated what I did in my particular study, and that is based upon a part of an animal, they figured out how big the animal was in its entirety. Over 12 centimeters. 12! That would make the entire... About length. two and a half meters in length. Over eight feet. So that's plausible. So they really did their research. Audience members at the Capitol screening were pleasantly surprised that the film received a stamp of approval from a bona fide giant bug expert. I thought it was pretty cool that the stuff in the movie was fairly accurate, and he was able to confirm that, which I thought was pretty neat. But of course, there was also a healthy dose of skepticism. It's kind of hard to relate to giant ants in the desert when you live in Cleveland. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> Well, that's our show. Remember, you can find all of our stories online at WOSU.org and on our free WOSU public media mobile app. And be sure to give us a follow on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, where our handle is aptly broad and high. We're closing out the show with more music from Driftmouth. For all of us here at WOSU, I'm Kate Quickle. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you back here next week. The old tree line homestead is bathed in a cool indigo. The low pine cast shadows that cut through the tall grass and creep up the pale gravel road. There's a sudden kind of light and a living look in your eyes. I spent, I'd say about five years maybe, doing pointillism. So I was using uh, alcohol ink pens on clay board. And I saw other people doing alcohol ink paintings. And, and so I learned that you could like buy the refills or buy inks separately and, and not use the pens, but just like slosh the, the inks on um, whatever substrate. And then I saw a video of somebody lighting their alcohol inks on fire, and they were working on tile, 
So I tried it on clayboard, and I like it even better on clayboard because the clayboard blisters up and it gives you texture, which the tile didn't do. And the, when the alcohol burns off, it goes out. It, it doesn't burn for very long. So I've, ne I've never had a board go out of control. <laughs> I've never had to use my fire extinguisher, but I do keep it handy just in case. The main point in lighting our fire is the chaos. So I've been doing these like really control pieces. You know, sometimes I cover the entire board with these intricate shapes. But the fire was freeing because it was like, okay, so now I have chaos. I lose control over the piece and then I can come in and like regain control. Catch Columbus at its creative best on Broad and High, Thursday nights at 8 o'clock on WOSU-TV. Production of Broad and High is funded in part by the Greater Columbus Arts Council, supporting arts, advancing culture, and connecting the community to artists, events, and classes at columbusmakesart.com. PNC, committed to Central Ohio, for the achiever in you. From these contributing sponsors, and viewers like you. Thank you.